Uh, three of us will be speaking to you today from our uh, data protection team. Um, I'm Tom Phipps, a consultant with the firm. Uh, I'll be talking uh, about uh, what uh, health data or what special category data is um, and, and the rules relating to its processing. Uh, my colleague Charlotte uh, Kingman, who's an associate with the firm, will then focus uh, on health data uh, and uh, uh, tell us about uh, some of the issues to do with that and also uh, the implications regarding COVID related data. And then uh, Hannah Pettit, who's a solicitor in the team, will talk about the documentation and policies needed uh, when processing uh, special category data. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with me. So if we can move on to the next uh, next slide, please. Next, uh, and then the next one, please. And the next one, please. So what is what special is category data? Well, uh, we all know what personal data is. It's uh, it's data from which an individual can be identified, whether in itself or when combined with other data. Uh, special category data is is a is a type of personal data, but is regarded by the law as particularly sensitive. And it is all those things listed on the slide, so racial or data relating to racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, uh, genetic or biometric data from which people can be identified health data in general uh, and data relating to sex life or sexual orientation. Uh, criminal records uh, are also relevant in this context. Technically, they're not special category data, but they are treated similarly by the uh, legislation, so they need to be taken into account. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the legal requirements for the collection and processing of special category data. Well, just like any other type of personal data, the first thing you have to do is establish a lawful basis. And there are six options or six possibilities to do that. Uh, consent, performance of the contract, compliance with the legal obligation, vital interests of the data subject, a public interest in the exercise of official authority or legitimate interests. Those are all uh, concepts that uh, anyone processing personal data will be familiar with. But the first thing you've got to do to process particularly sensitive data, a special category data that is, is, get, is establish your lawful basis. Once you've done that, you then need to go on to stage two which is on the next slide, please. So you've got your lawful basis in place, but you've then got to meet one of 10 available conditions to collect and process the data. The four key ones, rather, I won't bore you with all of them, but the four key ones are first, that you have the explicit consent of the data subject. Uh, second, uh, special category data collected and processed in connection with employment. Third, health and social data. And fourth, uh, special category data, which has manifestly been made public by the data subject. Key word there is manifestly. It has to be blindingly obvious that it's the data subject who's made the data public. Uh, it can't be something that's been made available by somebody else that the data subject hasn't uh, yet objected to, for example. So you've got to be able to establish that lawful basis on the previous slide and then one of the 10 conditions. And for, for most people uh, on the webinar today, it's likely to be, I suspect, one of those four that I've highlighted. Uh, next slide, please. So in the context of special category data, what is explicit consent? The concept of consent is, is a familiar one in the data protection arena. Uh, for example, uh, the obvious uh, one obvious example is uh, 
uh, ticking a box to consent to receiving marketing material uh, when you create an account uh, on a trading website, for example. Explicit consent is something more than that, though. Just like ordinary consent, it must be informed. The data subject must uh, know what data is being collected uh, and why it's being collected. And second, the consent must be freely given. Uh, so it can't be subject to, to any uh, any conditions and the data subject must have a continuing choice to remove the consent. So those concepts which apply to ordinary consent are also relevant to special category data explicit consent. But you have to go a stage further. It's not just a tick box exercise. Uh, the ICO's uh, way of putting it, although, although this isn't in the legislation, is that they regard explicit consent as consent which is expressly confirmed in words. So you have to go further uh, than, than a tick box. Just to give an example of one way uh, we've uh, sought to comply with that requirement in the context of an app uh, which collected special category data was uh, we, the way that we did it was we we required the data subject to have to enter a code to to indicate consent so it was more than just just ticking a box that there was a positive action that the data subject had to take to confirm that consent had been given so that's enough from me uh, now let's uh, let's hear from uh, charlotte uh, in relation to health data and covid related data in particular Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte Kingman. I'm an associate in the commercial data attraction team, and I'm going to be looking at specifically uh, the processing of health data. So why is this a relevant topic? Well, we often see a number of businesses overlook the processing of health data. They think it may not apply to them if they're not working specifically within the healthcare industry or within a, a similar industry. But actually, this is likely to um, to be something which every organisation will be required to do at one point or another. So what is health data? So the Data Protection Act defines health data as personal data relating to the physical or mental health of an individual, including the provision of healthcare services, which reveals information about their health status. So as you can see, this is an extremely broad definition, which means that the likely information that's going to fall under this is very, very wide, um, which is why most organisations are caught by this and will end up processing health data in one way or another. It includes current, past and future health status as well. So in the current climate, this could include things like COVID uh, tests or COVID vaccination status. I popped a few examples on the screen there just to uh, give you an indication of the of the breadth of information that this would cover, but also some of the more unusual examples um, which companies may not think would constitute health data. So, for example, information from health services, um, appointment details and even NHS numbers, if they're combined with other information that would give an indication about somebody's health, would fall under health data. If you collect information which would allow you to draw an inference about someone's health, that also uh, is captured as health data. So when is health data routinely captured? Well, there are some industries where it's, it's obvious and it's going to be part of their day to day processing activities. Um, this would be your healthcare professionals, so NHS bodies, GPs, dentists, etc. But there are a number of other industries where this is quite routine. So, for example, in the fitness industry, um, you might have gyms, personal trainings, but also fitness apps, um, which we see a lot of, particularly in the current climate, where you have, for example, trackers that are monitoring um, your heart rate, for example, whilst you do exercise. That would constitute uh, health data. Similarly, there are a number of well-being apps available on the market now. Um, things like Headspace, etc., um, often ask you uh, certain questions when you sign up to the app around your well-being and particularly around your mental health. So again, this would be captured. Um, similarly, research companies as well. So this could be um, any number of research could, could could fall under this this category given the broad range of information that falls under the definition of health data, but particularly any companies that are undertaking research around the pandemic as well would certainly be caught by this. The two areas that I want to focus on today are employee health data and COVID related data, as these are the two most common areas where businesses are likely to process health information. Um, employment health data is often an area that companies overlook um, when they're not working within the healthcare space. 
many companies will process data of employees. It's almost inevitable. So whether that's making adjustments for certain medical conditions and working practices, um, whether that's facilitating sick leave or sick pay, um, even just taking copies of doctor's notes, dealing with maternity requests, for example, undertaking individual risk assessments. So uh, making an assessment of somebody's working space, for example, could fall under this definition as well. Um, and even something as simple as an employee calling their line manager just to tell them, you know, they've got flu and they're not going to be in today would constitute health data. So it's likely that every single business will be caught by this. Consent is rarely appropriate as the basis for capturing employee health data. Um, this is because there is an imbalance of power that's recognised um, between the employer and the employee. So employee data is usually processed on the basis of a legal obligation, and that's your, your requirements that you need to meet under employment law status. Um, and often employment is then used as the processing condition, um, which Tom's already talked about. Occasionally, the processing may fall under health or social care as the processing condition if it is for the purposes of making an assessment of the employee's working capacity. So this may be in circumstances where there are occupational health issues that are attached and you need to think carefully about the reasons behind why you're actually collecting that certain information from that employee at that time. And that should be your basis for, for your processing condition. So just moving on to COVID related data, um, something that's particularly relevant at the moment, particularly as we look towards moving back to working um, within the offices and face to face. Um, so when does COVID data constitute health data? Well, there's a number of different ways that we're collecting COVID related data at the moment. Um, the first, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, is the track and trace system. This is where businesses are required to take contact information or require um, individuals to uh, tr check in through the NHS app. So that in itself doesn't constitute health data. So that's not something that you need to worry about in the context of special category data. Obviously, it is personal data. Um, however, there are some businesses that at the moment are required to go one step further, for example, checking someone's temperature when they come into a venue or um, have an appointment, for example, and also asking uh, visitors to their organisations or to their business to confirm whether or not they've had any COVID related symptoms within a particular period of time. Um, this would be things like gyms, uh, estate agents, for example, prior to house viewings, leisure centres, beauticians, hairdressers, etc. There's a really wide range of businesses at the moment that, and industries that are being caught by this requirement. So if you are taking the, that sort of information, then that would constitute health data and you do need to make sure that you've got appropriate measures in place to process that special category information. Similarly, something that I think is going to become increasingly uh, relevant in the next few months is employee related COVID data. So again, this could be asking your employees before they come back to the office whether or not they've had, um, for example, vaccinations or also whether or not they've had any symptoms within the last you know, two weeks or a particular period of time. And some companies may want to record whether or not employees have been vaccinated ahead of going back to what feels a bit more like business as usual. It's important to remember that the reasons for recording an employee's vaccination status must be clear and compelling. So the sector you work in, the kind of work that you do and the health and safety risk within your particular workplace should help you decide if you have a compelling reason to collect and process this information. So, for example, if you're working within an industry that is particularly high risk of contracting COVID, um, so that might be healthcare, then this would form part of your justification. But if you have no specified use for the information and are recording it on a just in case basis or to give you or your other employees comfort, then that's probably not going to be enough to collect this information and it's unlikely to be justifiable for you collecting it. So you should take into account that accepting um, things like the offer of a vaccination is a personal decision as well, which can be influenced by a number of factors. So when deciding whether to record this data, do be mindful of the public health advice and of the government guidelines. If you if the use of the data is likely to result in high risk um, and high risk to the individuals and to your staff, for example, denial of employment opportunities, then you also need to complete a data protection impact assessment, which Hannah will talk about in more detail in the next section. Um, but you also need to be mindful around things like uh, employment issues such as discrimination and whether or not you're inadvertently discriminating against particular groups of people. If there's good reason for collecting the information um, about whether your employees have had the vaccination, then it may well be lawful. Um, so for public authorities carrying out their function, they may be relying on doing this under a public task. 
Um, but for other private and public companies, legitimate interest is likely to be the most appropriate uh, lawful basis for doing this. But you must must make your own assessment of this and it must be particular to your organisation, your industry and your workplace. The processing condition for COVID related data really does depend on the circumstances and the reasons why you're collecting it in the first place. So sometimes you may decide that it's appropriate to seek consent, but do always bear in mind with, with consent, as Tom already talked about, it must be informed, freely given and data subjects can withdraw that consent at any time. Um, so it's not always appropriate in these types of circumstances. Um, it may also be for the purposes of health and social care, for public health, or there may be in some circumstances a substantial public interest um, condition that you can rely on. But the latter two conditions are quite complicated um, and we would advise you to, to certainly visit the ICO website and, and get as much information about this as you can, but then take advice if you think this is likely to apply to you. So what are the steps for processing health data? Well, the ICO has helpfully um, published a lot of information specifically around COVID. And one of the um, things that they've published is a six step guide when processing employee COVID related data. Um, but actually on review of these, they mirror the GDPR principles and they should apply really for any processing of any health data, not just in the COVID context. Um, so firstly, only collect what is necessary. So do you really need to collect this information? What impact will collecting the information have on your workplace? And could you achieve the same result without collecting that information? And I think the last point is really key. If you can achieve the same result without collecting it, the likelihood is you're not going to have a lawful basis for collecting it. If it's reasonable and proportionate to collect the information, then it's unlikely to raise a concern. So keep it to a minimum, um, particularly around COVID, this is really relevant. So it may be that you're temporarily collecting certain data, like has somebody had uh, symptoms within the last two weeks. If you are doing that, make sure that you've got a proper means for deleting that information and you're not keeping data for longer than is necessary, particularly when it is special category data and there are high, there's a higher degree of care that's attached to that. Be clear, upfront and open. Again, this is one of the key principles in the GDPR, which Hannah will go on to in a bit more detail anyway. Um, but you do need to make sure that your privacy notices are up to date when you're collecting any information, both for your customers and for your employees. Act fairly. Um, this is something that may not automatically spring to mind when you're thinking about uh, processing health data. But if you're making decisions about your workplace based on the health data that you're collecting, ensure that your approach is fair and think about whether there are any wider issues such as discrimination that need to be assessed before you, you undertake that collection and that processing. Information security, so implement good security practices. This obviously applies across the board for any processing of personal data, but it's particularly important for any processing of special category data. Make sure the data is kept secure and is only held for as long as you need it. And finally, inform individuals about their rights. So again, this is something that should already be set out in your privacy notices, um, but just make sure that it's clear and that individuals know what their rights are and how to enforce them. And finally, when processing health data, it's always a good idea to carefully think about the reasons behind why you're processing and why you're collecting it. And the likelihood is you will need to complete a data protection impact assessment, um, which Hannah will talk about in more detail. So I will hand over to Hannah to talk to you about documents and policies. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So I'm Hannah Pettit and I'm a solicitor in the data protection team at Ashford's. I'm going to be zooming back out now rather than focusing in on a particular area of special category data like the health data. I'm going to be looking at what documents and policies we need to put in place for any kind of special category data processing. So hopefully by the end of my section, you'll have a bit of a checklist that you can take away and work through um, should you be uh, processing any special category data. So what I'll start with is those documents and policies which are legally required and I'll address when they're legally required because for some there may be certain thresholds that need to have been met or only relevant for certain processing activities. Uh, I will then finish with a couple of additional good practice items that help you to demonstrate that you're acting in compliance with the legislation. So to begin with, then we'll look at data protection impact assessments and these are DPIAs. Now, this is effectively a risk assessment for any processing activity. So what you do is you record the risks associated with that processing activity and then any mitigating measures you put in place to counteract those risks, to address those risks. And once you've carried out the evaluation, you'll then make a decision as to whether you proceed with that processing activity. 
So it is important to stress this is something you do at the outset. So before you actually commence the processing activity, it's important that you carry out this risk assessment because it's what enables you to determine if it's appropriate to do so. Now, when are you legally required to carry out a DPIA? The legislation states that a DPIA must be carried out for any processing that's likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals. And it also sets out uh, a few specific circumstances where it's predetermined that these circumstances would arise or would result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals. And one of those is the large scale processing of special category data. So to summarise, if your processing of special category data is uh, on a large scale, then yes, absolutely, you need to be doing a DPIA. For any other processing of special category data, you need to Sorry, ask, whether, <laughs> ask whether it's likely to result in a high Sorry. risk to the rights and freedoms of personal data. Um, and the important thing is with any special category data, it's particularly high risk because of its sensitive nature. So that's something to bear in mind. And it means that in most cases, you will be meeting that threshold of it being higher risk processing, which requires a DP. Uh, DPIA. If you're unsure, then I would say err uh, on the side of caution, <coughs> because if you don't need to have a DPIA and you've done one, there's no harm. If you should have done one and didn't, obviously, then you've got a gap. So that would be the advice on that one. Now, if we move on to the next slide, this is looking in more detail at your privacy notices. So put simply, these are your documents which explain to data subjects what you're doing with their personal data. Uh, so you'll be telling them what data you're collecting and what you're doing with it. There is a little bit more to it than that, because under Article 13 and Article 14 of the GDPR, you have a list of requirements that each of those documents have to contain. But if we look at this just from the angle of special category processing, some of the sort of key pointers and things to bear in mind is that we would always recommend separating out that special category processing information. So don't just bundle it in with the other data. Really be clear about what special category data you're processing. Be clear about who you're sharing it with, what your lawful basis is and what your processing condition is. And as Charlotte touched upon, it may well be that this is changing throughout the life of your processing. So in the COVID uh, health data space, it may well be that you now need to be uh, documenting this in privacy notices where previously you hadn't done. So it's just being alive to the fact that they're working documents and they're not frozen at any point in time. Um, and it's making sure that you pay regard or give regard to all of your privacy notices. So you've got your external facing ones, which will be your website privacy policy, anything that's customer facing. But don't forget those internal privacy notices too. So these are your employee facing privacy notices. And especially because with employees, there is going to be a lot of special category health data you'll be collecting and processing about them. So it's important that all of that is covered off within your employee privacy notice. So if we now move on to the next slide and here we're looking at appropriate policy documents, uh, which is shortened and abbreviated to an APD. Now, an APD is not always required. It's only required for certain processing conditions and for certain processing conditions, the Data Protection Act states that you have to have a APD in place. Now, this is the case for the employment processing condition and also for a number of the substantial public interest processing conditions. So things like equality of opportunity, prevention of fraud, all of those you would need to have an APD in place if you wanted to rely on that processing condition. Now, what an APD is, is it's a document that sets out each of the UK GDPR principles, which I've got on that slide for you there. And for each principle, you then document how you're meeting that principle in relation to the special category processing. So if we take the security principle, for example, you might refer out to a separate security policy or separate security measures to show what practical measures you have in place to meet that principle. For the accuracy principle, you might talk about what measures you've got in place to make sure that any data you hold is kept accurate and up to date. Um, but once you've done that documenting process, you've worked through each principle and really explained how you meet each of those, you have the basis for your appropriate policy document. So it really is as simple as that. If we move on to the next slide then, a few of the final points that are legal requirements. So to start with, we've got the Article 30 processing record. 
Now you've got separate controller requirements and processor requirements. Uh, so it may well be that if your organization acts as both a controller and a processor, you'll have two separate records. Uh, but what is important to know is that if you've got fewer than 250 employees, you don't need to record all of your processing activities. You only need to record certain processing activities. Now that's in contrast obviously to organizations with 250 or more employees that will have to record everything. But one of the things you will always have to record um, is any special category data processing, which is why I make note of this point. And that's because regardless of the organization's size, you need to make sure you've got this processing record in place. I need to make sure that you've got all of your special category data processing covered off within it. So the next legal requirement is the requirement not to keep personal data for any longer than is necessary. Now, that's the legal requirement rather than a requirement to have a retention schedule or retention policy. But having that retention schedule or retention policy is the way that you meet your legal requirement. So setting out clear retention periods, which you've calculated based on your business needs and also with regard to any statutory timeframes. So things like under the Companies Act, uh, certain timeframes for keeping company registers, company documents. If you've got robust document with clear time frames set out, then you're then going to be able to meet your legal requirement not to retain and hold personal data for any longer than is necessary. And finally, on this slide, not strictly speaking a document or a policy, but what I did want to discuss is appointing a DPO. You are legally required to appoint one in certain prescribed circumstances. And one of those is if your core business activity consists of large scale data processing of uh, sorry, processing of special category data. So that's really relevant here because you may have started off with only a small level of special category processing. Um, but as your business develops, this may become one of your core activities. It may do so on a large scale. And at that stage, you're then triggering that need to appoint a deep so it's something to make sure that you're keeping under review as the business develops. Now on the next slide, just a couple of final points on good practice documents. So I would recommend putting in place a data protection policy. This sets out rules and procedures for your workforce, your contractors, anyone who's processing uh, personal data on your behalf. And it means that you've got clear expectations. This is important for any personal data processing, but especially for special category data, because here it's higher risk, as we've discussed. So it's important that your employees, contractors, etc., know what's expected of them. And also security policies and documenting those security measures that you have. And this is, again, important because when you're completing things like your DPIAs and looking at your APD, you can easily refer out to your security measures document. So it's, you know, it makes things a lot more streamlined if you've got all of your security measures documented in one place. So in conclusion, then on this final slide, I've listed for you all of the documents that I've covered. So this is the sort of the checklist of things to be thinking about. And if you've got comprehensive documentation in place, and this goes a long way to helping you demonstrate that you are compliant with the legislation, but a health warning and pun intended, but it's not just going to be enough to make sure you've got those documents in place. You need to be making sure that in practice you're complying with them and you're doing what you're saying you're doing in them. So, uh, so that's, you know, again, something to bear in mind. Thank you very much for joining us all today. Um, it's been really good to see some familiar names and also some new ones. And if anybody's got any questions at all about what Tom, Charlotte or I have spoken about, uh, we've got email addresses on this slide. So please do feel free to reach out to us.